I've offered this beginner series a lot of, uh, a number of times in the past. I don't know, this is maybe the sixth time I've done this. And one of the things that, um, that is always kind of interesting is the attrition from the, uh, the class. So a lot of people show up the first day and then half the people don't show up on the second lesson. And by the end, most of the people don't show up. And so I've sort of struggled to understand what, the, what motivates people to participate. And I think that one of the problems is that um, people are not able to see like what the payoff is, all right? So looking at this from economic terms, like why would you spend an hour or more a week trying to learn Python if you can't actually do anything useful for it? So what I decided I would do today is to primarily focus on just showing you some cool things you can do with Python in order to motivate you to learn a little bit more about this. And in the process of doing that, I'm also going to um, show you a little bit how to use the, uh, the, the programming platforms that we're gonna use in the class so that you will be um, prepared for this. So there are a, a lot of tools, great tools that you can do to manage data, visualize data, things like Excel, Excel is awesome. OpenRefine is great for like wrangling data. Tableau is great for visualizations. But these are all basically pre-built like graphical interfaces. So they're like easy to use. And if they do what you want them to do, then they're awesome. They're probably a lot easier to get the job done than, than learning how to code something. But what if they don't do what you want them to do. What if you want them to do something different? Then you don't, you can't make them do something they're not programmed to do. So I think of this sort of like um, music. So, you know, if you enjoy, let's say you enjoy listening to guitar music. So you can, uh, you know, buy an MP3, or I guess now people would just subscribe to Spotify or whatever and listen to recordings of professional guitar players. And that's really awesome. But what if you don't like the way they play the guitar? What if you wish they played it differently? Well, you of course could have the option of playing it yourself, right? Just pick up a guitar and start doing it. Oops, well, like I don't even know how to play the guitar, right? So if I wanted to take that option, if I wanted to make my own music, I'm gonna have to learn how to play the guitar. Nobody that I know of can just pick up a guitar and start playing beautiful music. The only way they're gonna be able to play even reasonable music is by practice. And so I think that coding is a lot like this, that um, you, it, it takes, you, you can't, most people can't just like start coding without uh, getting some practice and building up some skills, just like you can't pick up a guitar and start playing. So I'm telling you this because um, the, the uh, sort of operating principle of these six lessons that we have in this series is sort of like you know beginner guitar lessons. And so by the end of the six lessons, you should be able, you should be more or less proficient to do some basic things. You're still going to need to practice more if you want to be really good. This class is, is not designed for teaching people to be professional programmers or software engineers. Like if you wanna do that, then you need to go major in computer science. This, um, these lessons are designed for people who have work they, they wanna get done, uh, something they wanna accomplish. They wanna learn enough coding to get the job done, but not necessarily to become a professional coder. So that's, that's sort of the audience that we're shooting for here. And one of the great things, which I'm gonna demonstrate here in just a, a moment, is that there are a lot of already built libraries that do the heavy lifting for you. So for example, if you wanna do uh, named entity recognition on some text, you don't have to write all that code yourself. Someone has already written a library that does that, but you have to know enough Python to get your text in and once the results come out to figure out what to do with them. And so part of our goal, we're gonna learn basic things about 
how you assign things to variables and what the basic data structures are and so on, with the goal being that you could you have enough skills in sort of this basic manipulation and, and basic operations that you could Google, how do I do named entity recognition? Find some code that somebody has written and then figure out how to hack that code to make it work for yourself. I'm not gonna teach you how to do uh, training for machine learning. Like again, you need to go to the Data Science Institute for that. But I am gonna show you how you can run a script that uses a pre-trained model to do named entity recognition and how you can get the data out of that. I'm gonna show you that actually in just a minute. So that's sort of the level that we're hoping for is a level of proficiency that would allow you to take, write your own basic code or to take somebody else's code and understand it well enough that you can figure out how to make it work. So if that's the kind of reason why you wanna learn Python, then this is like probably the class for you. I mean, also, I personally, I love coding. I just think it's fun. Some, you know, if I'm bored and I don't have anything to do, I like to just write Python because it's, I don't know, it presses some little endorphin button in my brain when I write some code and it does what I want it to. So, um, you know, some of you may be like that. You just want to learn this for an intellectual exercise, but most people, you've got some kind of job you want to get done. So what I thought I would do is start off, um, Let's see, actually, before I do this, let me bring up the chat. Okay, so because I'm not really having any interactivity with um, re the remote people, I'm putting the chat on the screen here. Um, you are welcome to unmute and ask questions. Um, looks like we have 13 remote people. So that's not so many that you couldn't interrupt and just ask me a question, that's fine. You're also welcome to put a question in the chat. And for those of you in the live audience, also anytime in the next you know, six weeks, feel free to you know, get my attention and just say, hey, I have a question or whatever, because I want, I want this to be as, as interactive as possible. So don't be afraid to do that. Okay, so what I thought I would do is uh, to tell you a little bit about a project I'm working on now that involves doing a lot of different bits of Python coding. So I'm actually working with the Fi Vanderbilt Fine Arts Gallery to um, get information about all of their works into Wikidata. So if you're not familiar with Wikidata, this is what Wikidata looks like. So here's an example of an artwork. I think this is one that's over in Kirkland Hall. And so you can see there is some basic descriptive stuff uh, you know, what it is. It's called the Emily Thorne Vanderbilt Sloan. It's a painting. Uh, and then there's a lot of other metadata, like when was it painted? Where is it located? What is its title? What is the main subject of it? Okay, that's a little bit tricky. And then uh, what's it made out of? What does it depict? Okay, so what we are, the, the part of our, um, project is to be able to take metadata that we have from the gallery's database and to be able to learn some things from it so that we can improve the quality of the data that's on Wikidata. So we already have created about 7,000 items in Wikidata, one for each of the, um, the works that are in the gallery. And so if you look at the kind of data that we have, you see that we have a lot of labels for different things. So, but the, but the gallery database does not, um, like it doesn't have a lot of information. So for example, if we wanted to know where are all the coins that they, how many coins are there in the collection? Like we don't have that information. How many Chinese, ancient Chinese things are in the collection? Okay, we don't have that information either. So part of the project that what we're trying to do is to, be able to look at these labels here and to try to figure out things that we can learn about the objects themselves by messing around with the labels. The other thing that, um, that I also have access to uh, is I have uh, like probably about 5,000 of the images that have been taken. So, so I can look at the image of an item and I can also look at the label of the item. And from that, I can learn things about what it is. 
So if you look at the labels, you'll see they, there are different sorts of things. So like here's one called a victim of landmines, Kabul, Afghanistan. Okay, that's, that's describing what is in this photograph. Uh, on the other hand, if you have something like uh, Araka from American Artists 50th Anniversary Portfolio. Okay, the, this is not a description of what's in there. This is actually the title of the thing is, is Arca, whatever that is. Uh, it's same with this one. Here's a print called Abigail Before David. That's probably the title of it. Then we have other situations. Here's like uh, Bizenware Saki bottle, Bizenware figurine of a kappa. I don't know what a kappa is. Okay, so in this case, the title is not, or the, the label is not the title of the object. And it's not a description of what's depicted in the object. It's actually a description of the object itself. It's a teapot, it's a bowl, it's a sake cup or whatever. So what we have been trying to do is um, to develop a sort of workflow. I mean, one thing we could do is hire a student worker and have them go through all 7,000 of these things very laboriously and say like, okay, this is a cup, this is a coin, this is a painting or whatever. But what we wanna to try to do is to use, to be smart and use things like machine learning and image analysis to try to help us understand what these titles mean without somebody having to go through and do that all manually. So it turns out that if we can divide the works into categories, there seem to be some patterns about like what those titles mean. So for instance, if they're three-dimensional works, a lot of times it'll have, the, the thing will be a description of the object and then what it's in the form of. So like, um, I don't know, a, a bowl in the form of a turtle. Okay, so that tells you it's a bowl and it's in the shape of a turtle. Or it might say, a bowl with, uh, with the design of bamboo. Okay, so that tells us it's a bowl and it has a picture of bamboo on it. So we can look at those kind of labels and split them apart and figure out some things about like what, what, what's on them or what kind of things they are. On the other hand, if we have like two dimensional works, a lot of times, it's a title, but one of the other complicating things is that if you look at the title, here's Bontachine Quatrefeuille Cup. Okay, so that's like partly in French. A lot of these uh, uh, things are in other languages. Let's see if I can find another one. Well, okay, I can't. Okay, here. Fond de Ile de Argentine. So this one actually has the French title, and then in parentheses, it has the English translation. So that's cool, like this contains information about the title in two languages. So one of the things that we'd like to do would be like split that apart and then find the English part of it and the other parts of it. So anyway, you get the idea. There's a number of things that we could do. We could, we could try to figure out like what's the language. We could break it into pieces if there's translations. One of the other tricky things is there is an, um, if there are posters, a lot of times they say something, okay? But they are generally categorized as prints. And so if you look at what prints are like in the collection, a lot of times some of them are like this, but some of them are like this, okay? So the one on the left is actually a, an art print, okay? It's like, a, you know, it's like an artistic design. The one on the right is a poster, okay? And so it would actually be great if we could say, like, is this thing a poster or is it like an artistic print? Because if it's an artistic print, then the label that we have is probably the, the title of the thing. Whereas for the posters, usually the label is what does it say on the poster itself? So we can, in this case, we could try to use machine learning to figure out like, are there words on the poster or not? So what I'm gonna do, so this is basically um, the task. The task is to try to um, go through these different kinds of works. And in the end, what we are gonna end up with, remember I said that in Wikidata, one of the things that we would like to have is what does it depict? What is it made of? what is the main subject of that thing? Those are all things that would be hard to know 
unless like a person went through manually. But there is some potential that we have of being able to do this automatically if we can figure these different things out. So what I've done is I've written a number of Python scripts. Um, and I'm not going to go through the details, but really just show you um, what happened. So here's one, Rachelement du pain ou mon soeur à l'homme. Well, that's a diacritic, en ville. So there's the French. And then the rationing of bread, man going downtown to dine, that's the translation. So I've used Python and a rule to split this thing apart anytime there's a parenthesis like this. And then there's a, a, a Python library. It's called, um, let's see, what's it called? It is called Lang Detect. And so I can just pass these bits of labels into this Lang Detect thing. And it says with 99.999% precision that it thinks this is in French. And it thinks with 99.999 precision that this is in English. So that's cool. It's actually good to split them apart because like if I pass this whole thing in there, well, half of it's in English, half of it's in French. And so I need to be able to like decide how am I gonna break it into pieces. Also, sometimes the things are in parentheses and they're not translations. Maybe it's just a parenthetical expression. So one of the things that I can do is say, break it in half wherever there's a parentheses and check on the language. If the language of what's inside the parentheses is the same as what's outside the parentheses, then forget about it, it's not a translation. Okay, so that's a kind of like algorithmic thing that's like really super simple to do in your Python code to make a decision about like, is this a translation or not? Okay, so that that's, fits into our flow chart in this section here called language detection. Okay, then here's another fun thing that we've been working on. If you're into, um, if you're into uh, text analysis, it turns out that there are some ways that you can, th there are some libraries that you can use to do different sorts of name, um, name recognition. And so one of the things that, uh, so there's actually three different libraries. There's one called NLTK, which I'll talk about more later. That stands for Natural Language Toolkit. There's another one called Spacey. These are both libraries that you can run locally. And then there's a third one called Parallel Dots. Parallel Dots is actually run by a commercial company that offers an API. And so if you want to use Parallel Dots, you have to connect with their API and you basically send them a string of text and you say, hey, are there any named entities in there? Okay. It turns out, if you look at this, like the title of this thing is Attempted Suicide from the Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Okay, Natural Language, um, National Language Toolkit thinks that the word idiot is a um, geographical or political entity. Like what? Like, you know, Korea or the United States. Okay, that's like completely wrong. Okay, got. Fedor Dostoevsky, I already got that right. Spacey flunked out, didn't do so well. Parallel Dots, it turns out, actually work, is, works quite well. I think the other two mostly look at whether things are capitalized or not to decide like whether they're named entities, whereas, of course, this is like a commercial company, right? So they, they do a better job because they actually pay people to work on this. The problem here is that the free tier of Parallel Dots only lets you search about 300 phrases a day. And there are 7,000 phrases in the database. So the script that I was just showing you here actually has a, a thing. It just basically runs all the time and it keeps checking, is it tomorrow yet? <laughs> so it, it, does, uh, it goes to the Parallel Dots API and does 300 uh, named entity recognitions. And then it sits there and it checks whether it's tomorrow or not. And as soon as it's tomorrow, it does another 300 and it sets the date to be the, the previous date. So it's just constantly running all the time. I'm up to about, I've done about 6,000 out of 7,000. Like I would never remember to do this every single day manually, right? But I've written a script, it just runs all the time. And in a, less than a week from now, I'll be done with all 7,000 of them. 
Okay, here's another fun thing. So going back to this issue of, of is a print a poster or not? So it turns out there's a really cool thing. It's called um, Keras OCR. And Keras is a, is a machine learning system. And so if you're doing machine learning, you can train the system yourself, which is like, I don't really know how to do that, right? Because I don't, I haven't taken machine learning classes. I mean, I could probably figure it out if I spent six months working on it. But it turns out that someone has already create, has already done the training on images to figure out whether they have words in them or not. And so you can just basically download the training data and then run your own images through this pipeline. So the, the code here is actually not that complicated. You know, here you're basically saying, hey, import all this work that somebody else did and then start up a pipeline. And then, uh, then I go through and say, these are the two images that I wanna use. They're both from Wikimedia Commons. Oh, actually that was my test. Here's two of the images from our collection. So I run it into the pipeline. This is what the raw output looks like. So basically what it's saying is it, it found the word fisheries, it found the word of, it found the word livestock. And then these numbers here tell you like where, what pixels on the picture did you find them? So then I go through and I have to understand this Python data structure well enough to be able to pull out the bits that I want. So this part of the code down here pulls out the bits that I want. And then um, I can actually have it display. So here it is. These are, here's the analyzed picture. So it's found the word fisheries, it's found the word development, it's found the word family. One of the things it doesn't do is it doesn't put them in order. It just says like, I found all these words and here they are on the image. So that's like kind of annoying because I'd really like it to say AIDS brings death to family farms who is left to do the farm. But it doesn't do that. It just gives me, it just tells me what all the words are. But it turns out that I don't actually care about that. And the reason I don't care about it is because of this spreadsheet that I have here. I already, if it's a poster, then at least some of the words on the poster are listed right here. So what I did was, um, I, as a test, these are the poster labels for the two works that I tested. And if you see, this says Ministry of Livestock and Fisheries Development, AIDS brings death to family farms. Well, those words are definitely here. There's also a bunch of other words. So what I can do, there is a library, it's quite amusingly called Fuzzy Wuzzy. And what it does is fuzzy string matching. And there's different kinds of fuzzy string matching that it can do. But one of the things that it can do is called a partial ratio, which means it looks to see if the, your set of words is included in a larger set of words. And that's exactly what I want. So all I did was I said, okay, take all these words that you found here, that's our larger set of words. Take all of the words that are in this title and see if these words are found in there. And so if you look at the similarity ratio that I got, the partial ratio is 100%. So basically, bingo, this is a poster and there are words on that poster that are exactly the same as the label that we have in our database. So that's gonna like vary. So not only is it gonna answer the question, is this an art print or is this a poster? It's also going to tell us that like, yes, what you have in this label are actually words that are on that poster. Okay, I'm gonna show you one last example. This one is super fun and you're gonna actually get to try this yourself. So this is um, again, a machine learning uh, system called CV2. CV2 stands for computer vision. So it's like an open source com computer vision system. And so if you do, um, like machine learning, you can train the image to, you can train the uh, program to look for whatever you want. But it turns out that people have already run training on a bunch of images to de detect faces. So all I have to do is basically go to, go to GitHub and, and pull the uh, training. Yeah, so here's, here's a training data called Har Cascade 
frontal face default.xml. So this is the training data for detecting the front of somebody's face. So I just load that in, shove it in uh, to the pipeline, and then I run it. Let's see, I think I have the original image here. Let's see, I hope I still have it. No, not that one. Clicking on the wrong thing. Uh, is it this one? Yes, okay. So this is a picture of Zachary Ostrock, who's like a, a, a sculptor from the 1800s or whatever. And when I run this script, so the interesting, one of the things that we're interested in is these scripts were all trained on photographs, right? So this is not a photograph, this is actually a print. So one of the things that we were testing is like, if we run this face detection thing on photos, how often of the time does it um, find the face? Well, the answer is almost all the time because it was like trained on photos, right? But the fun thing is like, well, how often does it find the face if it's a print? Like this is an engraved print or if it's a statue. So like if it's a statue and the face is like pretty realistic looking, it'll detect it. If it's like, you know, uh, uh, um, Picasso or something where the face is all weird, then it doesn't know that that's a face. Okay, so the, the, the jury's still out on how well it can detect faces. But one of the cool things is, okay, so the title of this image is like this, the, uh, the sculptor Zachary Ostrock, right? So if I run named entity recognition, it's gonna say, I think that Zachary Ostrock is the name of a person. And then I run this and it says, hey, I found a face on here. Then there's a high probability that this is actually a picture of Zachary Ostrock, right? As opposed to like Zachary Ostrock is the painter or something like that. So this is a little bit of a dicier thing and it might actually require people to look at this, but you could imagine like a game for people who come into the gallery where you'd say like, hey, we found this face. And we think this is a picture of Zachary Ostrock. Do you think that's right? And uh, I mean, like they maybe aren't gonna know because they probably don't know who this guy is. But if it's something like, um, hey, we uh, found this face and we think this is John F. Kennedy, is that right? Well, then we have now, and, 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 the, and the person who's playing this game goes like, yep, that's right. Then we've basically figured out a way to automate the process of filling in this part where we ask um, who is depicted in the work or who is the main subject of the work. Okay, so this is like a lot of stuff. But anyway, the point is that there are all these amazing tools for machine learning, facial recognition. And to use those tools, if you, if you look at the code, it's not like complicated code because most of the complicated code is in the libraries. It's just, mostly getting the pictures in and getting the data out. And that's the kind of stuff that we're gonna learn how to do. So anyway, I hope I have just enticed you a little bit of some of the fun things and interesting things that you could do with Python. The other thing that, um, that I'm actually gonna get into next is um, how you can easily run other people's codes. And it turns out like there's an innovation recent, you know, in the last five or 10 years called code notebooks. They are super easy to share and they are super easy to run. So you don't have to do a lot of painful software installation. You don't have to, um, you know, learn how to compile code and run things in the command line. You just download the code notebook and you run it. So we'll talk about code notebooks in just a minute, uh, but I'm gonna pause now uh, just to give people uh, a an opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, actually, after this, I'm gonna talk about sort of the format of the class, and then I'm gonna show you some, uh, how the notebooks work. And then I have an example notebook that I want you to play with, and you'll get to try doing like facial recognition and stuff with that code notebook. So what questions do you have? All right, I'm not seeing question here. Anybody, uh, the remote people have a question you wanna put in the chat? How about this? Put a, um, a one plus or something in the chat if you're feeling okay at this point. 
All right, I see one. Okay, cool. Okay, I think in general, people are cool. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about the format of this. So the first thing that I wanna tell you is that the place that everything comes from is the link that you use to register. It's vander, B I dot L T slash P Y. So vander B dot L T slash pi. This is the, the lead off point to everything you need to know. So this table down here is the table on each day that is gonna uh, give you links to the materials that are associated with a particular lesson. So some of you may have already looked at the ones for today. Um, next week, here is the lesson video. So the idea of, of how this the lessons are to be structured is sort of like the, I, I hate this buzzword, but this, the flipped classroom idea. So if you look at each one of the lessons after the first day, you see that there are a series of like three to seven minute videos. Here's a three minute one, here's a seven minute one, here's a two minute one and so on. And so what it does is it introduces some ideas in the video. And then there's some uh, sort of like a short summary of what's covered in the video here. And then one of the key pieces here is at the top, there's a thing called these lesson notebooks. So the lesson notebooks have the code that is discussed in the video. So as you're watching the video, you can be running the code yourself to see what happens when you run it. And I, so what I'm gonna show you next is like how you access these notebooks and, and how you run them. So the idea is that you open up the notebook, you watch the videos, you try things out. And then after you've worked your way all the way through the lesson, at the end of the lesson, each one of them has a practice assignment. So the idea is if you are able to, and if you have the time, you should watch the videos and you should step through the example notebook for the lesson ahead of the class. At the class, I'll do a quick run through of the key points. I'm not sure I can cover everything in the detail, that's in the videos because the total length of the videos can sometimes be up to an, an hour. I, usually it's less than that. But what my goal is to spend about a half hour talking and answering questions about the content of this page. And then the last half hour is just basically time for you to work on the practice assignment to try practicing doing these things. And it's working on the practice assignment while I'm here for you to ask questions. You're welcome to like go to get together with and work on this together with somebody else or however you want to do it. But this is where the practice is. I'm not going to say that just doing the practice assignment is enough that you're going to be like an expert, but it will reinforce the stuff that's in the video. And it also, um, the first ones are like pretty easy. And then as we go on, they get a little bit harder because they use some of the content from the previous lessons and, and build on top of that. So that's basically the plan. And also, I mean, like I understand realistically, people are busy, people have conflicts. So one of the reasons for having all the videos is that if, it, if you are not able to come to the sessions or to join us online, you can work through the stuff on your own and then you won't necessarily fall behind. You can come back. If you, if you miss a week, you should be able to come back and keep on going. Or if you decide like, oh my gosh, I just don't have time for this. You can, you can work on it on your own. And I'm always available for answering email questions or whatever. Okay, so just to recap, what you should do then for next week is you should, uh, before, Wednesday, October 27th, try to watch the videos and work through the example code book. And then next week, I will talk about the content of that and we'll work on the practice lesson that's on this page, all right? So does anybody have any questions about like the format, how that's gonna work? I see people looking like they are, they're good. Okay, so let's 
get down to the nitty gritty and let's talk about uh, a code notebook. So before we look at code notebooks, I wanna show you sort of like the old fashioned way that people would do Python or there's actually an even more hardcore way that I'm not going to show you, but so the the sort of old fashioned way of doing Python is to have a code editor. And you would write the code in a code editor like what I have right here, and then you would go up here and you would um, you would save the code. Then you would go to the command line and let's see what did I call this example.py. then you would say Python three example.py it starts to run the code okay so it's told me what pi is now it wants me to give it the diameter of a circle i'll type three it says the area of the circle is seven okay that's exciting um so anyway the point here is that like in the old-fashioned way of coding you write the code you save it and then you go to the command line and you run it and so if like there's something wrong with your code, it's kind of annoying because like, especially if it's a really long script and it doesn't work, then you have to figure out like, well, where's the place where it doesn't work? What did I do wrong? And it's like fairly hard to debug. <coughs> there are actually these things called integrated development environments or IDEs that make this easier by telling you like what the values are of variables and stuff like that. There's there's a, a pretty good one called the spider IDE. So, you know, you can use that and it makes it a little less painful than the code editor. But what I'm going to recommend, and one of the reasons for recommending this is zero software installation. So like if you're gonna do, if you're gonna do um, the, uh, code editor thing you have to install the code editor and you have to you have to install python and all that so the thing the thing that everybody is using is jupyter notebooks so what i'm going to do is just show you a jupyter notebook and how it works and then i'm going to show you the version of jupyter notebooks that we're going to use which are called colab so if you are like if you're working in a lab or something and everybody's using Jupyter Notebooks and they say, you really should use Jupyter Notebooks, you can do all the stuff we're doing in Jupyter Notebooks. So for example, if you go to this lesson here, you can see that there's a Jupyter Notebook and there's a CoLab Notebook. They're both the same thing. So if you want to use a Jupyter Notebook, you can um, click on this link. So I'll just do a quick run through. So here's what the Jupyter Notebook looks like. I can right click on raw and say save link as and I'm going to save it in my downloads folder okay then if I go into the Jupyter um, platform go to my downloads folder here it is example.ipynb so the idea behind these code notebooks is that they are composed of little bits called cells. And the nice thing is that interspersed in between the code cells, there are markdown cells. So markdown is like a markup language just for typing in text or whatever. So what you can do is you can have an explanation of what's going on in a markdown cell, and then you can have a little bit of code, and then you can have more explanation, and you can have more code, and you can have more explanation, and you can have more code. So unlike this where there's just a whole script and it's like it runs a whole thing at once you can run the code in pieces so i will do so here it's saying pi is 3.14 then it says print what pi is then it's going to wait for you to type something in and then print what you typed in so if i go up here and i click run it told me that pi was 3.14159 now it's waiting for me to type in a number i'll type in three and hit enter Okay, now it says it needs to convert from diameter to radius. So if I run this cell, it tells me the radius is 1.5. So you can see that after each cell, after you run each cell, the output is displayed on the screen right after the cell. So you can see like what was going on. And then the last part is to print out calculation of the radius of the circle or the area of the circle, and there it is. So this is the idea of the code notebook. And then 
If you want to like basically erase what you have here, you can go up here and say, uh, let's see, where is it? Cell. You can say clear all output. And then it basically erases all the output. So if you want to like have somebody else look at this and you don't want it to show what's already run, you could do that. Or if you want to share this notebook with somebody and you want them to see what it looks like when you've run it, you then don't erase it and just share the notebook with the output. Okay, so that's the basics of how a Jupyter notebook works. But as you can see, it was like kind of annoying because we had to go to GitHub and then we had to down right click and download and then we also had to install Jupyter notebooks and like when I taught these lessons before we would spend the entire first hour just getting to the point where people could run a Jupyter notebook. Thankfully, there is a much easier way to do this, and this is called Google Colab. So, as we know, Google is like Google does everything amazingly. They do Google Earth and all this. So Google does amazing code notebooks called Colab. So what I want you to do right now, uh, you can actually do this with me. Um, so if you go to vanderbit.lt slash py, you'll end up on the lesson page. And then the example code notebook that we're going to play with is just stashed on the installation videos page. Not because it really belongs there, but just because that was an easy place to put it because you're actually not going to have to install anything. So click on lesson one installation videos and then scroll down to where it says example collab notebook. Now, when you click on, so one of the things is um, if you want to save your work on a collab notebook, you have to have a Google account. So that's the one downside. Of course, Google is like, Google runs the planet, but most people already have like Gmail or they have Google Drive or whatever. So if you have Gmail or Google Drive, you're, you're basically good to go. Now, when you click on that link, the problem is it is going to take you to my Colab notebook. My Colab notebook, you can actually run, but you cannot save because it's my notebook, right? It's not your notebook. So if you want to be able to save if you mess around with this notebook and change it and you want to save it, then you want then you need to make a copy of it yourself. So if you go up to the file menu and you say save a copy in drive. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. It says could not open a new browser window because I blocked pop-ups, but I'm going to say open it in a new tab. Okay, so now if I look at the title, it says copy of example IPYNB. So once you do that, it will make a copy on your own Google Drive. And so if you go to your Google Drive, the, I think there'll be a, a, in like your folders, there'll be one that says collab or whatever. And you look in there and it'll be there. So once you make your own copy, now you can run it. So it, the way that you run a collab notebook is similar to what I showed you with the Jupyter Notebook, except instead of going to the top and clicking run, there's a little button, a little run button over here on the left. So I'm going to click this run button. Now, the, it's actually, I don't know what it's doing under the hood. You see, it's it uh, it took a while before it actually did anything. I think that's because it's it has to like spin up a Docker container. It's doing something, it's doing its own thing off in the cloud once you start running the notebook. The other thing is like, because Google's doing this for you for free in the cloud somewhere, it's not gonna just leave this notebook running forever. If you stop messing with the notebook for like 15 minutes and come back, it'll say, you had 15 minutes of inactivity, so we shut down the notebook. Click here if you wanna start it back up again. So it, it's not happening on your local computer. So there is sort of that restriction. But anyway, it went ahead and did this. Now it wants to know, let's try a circle with a radius of five. Okay, so there it is. It printed back my answer five. Now, if I want to go down here, I click on the next one. It says the, the diameter was five, the radius is 2.5. Um, the area of the circle, if I run this, is 19.6. Okay, so this is like a pretty dumb, trivial program. But 
in this example notebook, I have put some actual fun things to do here. So, um, so what you should do, so what I want you to do is to, to try running this code and playing around with it. Like you don't have to worry about breaking anything. You could just like delete it and recopy my notebook over again. So one of the things I hope that you do is to try, try stuff, try changing things, try breaking things, see what happens. Um, so uh, I'm just, well, let's go ahead and run this. The, uh, so what I'll, I'll explain a little bit about what the code does. I don't expect you to understand the code, although by the end of this lesson series, you should understand a lot of what the code does here. But one of the things that I mentioned is that um, you don't have to write all the code yourself. So at the beginning of a lot of code, you see this thing called import. And basically that means, hey, somebody else has written cool code and I want to run it. I don't want to write it myself. So when I say import request, request is a module that communicates across the internet. So what I'm doing here actually there is an API called api.opennotify.org issnow.json. This is an API and the only thing it does is it tells you where the International Space Station is at any moment in time. Okay, so that's, I don't know whether that's cool or not. I think it's sort of cool, maybe not that useful. But anyway, the request module is how I can send a request to that API, basically saying, hey, um, where's the International Space Station? So let's go ahead and run this. And so if you run this in a local, local Jupyter notebook, it will actually open a new tab in your browser automatically. But because this is working in the cloud, it like it doesn't, this is happening off in the cloud somewhere and it can't really open up a tab on your browser. But if you do it in a local Jupyter notebook, it'll open a tab, but it does create this hyperlink here. So just for fun, I showed you, this is what the API is actually sending back to you. So it looks kind of like gobbledygook, but we'll talk about, we'll talk about data structures like lists and, and dictionaries and you'll learn to recognize this. And then I've turned it into a Python data structure. Then I have pulled the bits out of that data structure and created a URL for Google Maps. And when I click on this URL, let's see, where is the space station right now? It is over the Pacific Ocean, just east of the Philippines. So what you can do, this is live. So wait about five minutes and try running the script again, and you'll see the space station will be up probably closer to Hawaii. Okay, so that's kind of a fun thing. The point of this is we can use Python to get information from APIs that um, would be difficult for it. Like people make information to you available through APIs that you have great trouble finding out yourself. Like I don't, I'm sure there's some way to calculate where the International Space Station is, but I would have no idea how to do it. I don't have to know how to do it because I can get the information from an API. Okay, the next one, this is a little bit more fun. So I mentioned there's a thing called Natural Language Toolkit. And Natural Language Toolkit was one of the ways I was doing named entity recognition. And I said it didn't do very well, because, but part of it was because the, um, these titles that we had for the art pieces, they're all like titles. So they're in title case. They, they have like weird words capitalized and stuff. But if you actually take real text from somewhere, it does a pretty good job of the named entity recognition. So this part up here, um, so I'm loading several libraries, NLTK. And the other thing that's great about Colab is it already, so there's a process called installing. Installing basically means copying the code from somewhere in the cloud and putting it in your computer. Once you've done that, then you can load that anytime in the future. So you only have to install one time, you can load as many times as you want. So if you have your own personal Jupyter notebook and you try to run this code, the first thing that it probably will do is say like, I don't know what NLTK is, you're gonna have to download that. But with Google Colab, 
they already have NLTK, so I don't think it has to load that. Occasionally, there are packages that it doesn't have, and then you do have to install them, and I have, I think I have that in one of the examples. But anyway, I'm going to run this, and then it's going to deload, it's going to download the training data and uh, words and a bunch of stuff that it needs to do the named entity recognition. So it might take a little bit because it has to download and unzip some stuff. Okay, so it says it's done. All right, that's cool. Then what I did, and here's where you can play with this. I just went to npr.org, went to their very first news story yesterday and copied a sentence or, or a couple sentences from it and pasted it in here. So what you can do if you want to just in between these triple single quotes at the end here and the triple single quotes in the beginning, you can copy and paste your own text in there. So what this is going to do, it's, it's basically this line finds all the words in the sentence. Then I take all the words and I pass that in, and then it tags them all for parts of speech, like this is a verb. This, I think this is a verb. I think this is a noun. I think this is an adjective. And then the last part is their thing for finding out whether they think it's a named entity or not. So let's go ahead and run that. Okay, so here's what sort of the raw output looks like. It's a little bit hard to interpret, but um, this is like, uh, let's see, I forget what all the codes are here, but if any of the ones that start with N are nouns. JJ is adjectives. Um, and somewhere there should be verbs in here too. Okay, well, anyway. There's co these codes all have meanings, but then here's the places where it says, I think I've found a named entity. So here's Donald Trump. Here's Steve Bannon. Here's the House. Okay, that's actually, they got that one right. The, the House of Representatives is an organization. And then, uh, yeah, so then what I did in the last part is I went through this kind of gobbledygook and I went through and pulled out all the bits that I want so that I could make them in a more human readable way. So when I do that, basically I'm saying, list all the things you found. So here's a geographical and political entity, the US, good job, got that right. We already said it got the house right and it got, so it gets 100%. It didn't do that well on our art titles, but for this particular thing, it worked quite well. It got every, basically found everything and it got it all right. So that's cool. So you, there are other things that we are working on in using this, like not just for named entities, but like finding patterns of like adjectives and nouns. So remember one of the things on our project I said we wanted to do was say like, what kind of thing is it? So it might say a clay pot, or it might say a, um, a uh, wooden pipe or something like that. So we want to be able to pull out noun phrases like that. And there's and part of the natural language processing, you can do that. It requires a little bit of experimentation, but that's a, another kind of thing you can do besides just looking for named entities. Okay, the last thing, and again, you can hack this. I just picked this out because like, you know, who doesn't like the Beatles, right? So I went to Wikimedia Commons and one of the, if you go to Wikimedia Commons, you can, uh, it'll, if you say download, it'll take you, it'll give you the URL of, uh, no, sorry, that's not it, it's here. It'll give you the URL of the file if you want to download it. So you can go in here and go to actually any place on the web that has a picture. It doesn't have to be making Wikimedia Commons. And you can put your own URL in this cell right here and try it on something other than the Beatles. Okay, so again, here it's loading a bunch of libraries that do complicated things. Now we're doing a thing. We're making two functions of our own here. These are functions that, uh, that I constructed with help from Googling how to do it. So if we run this, uh, it's going to import a bunch of stuff. Okay, done with that. That was pretty fast. Now here's part of the fun part. There are actually four different trained models for facial recognition. The first one is the mo the least restrictive model. So let's try running this. Uh, oh, wow, it's done already, okay. So it's downloading the model. Now here's where it actually loads the image and runs the model. So this is a little bit slower. 
It has to grind away a little bit. Oh, it still didn't take that long. Oh, look at that. Isn't that great? Look, it found the faces of the four beetles. However, it also thought the knobs on the guitar were a face. And also it thought the wrinkles on, who is that, Paul McCartney's sleeve. It thought that was a face. Okay. So like I said, this is not a very strict trained model. What I can do, this is called commenting out. If I go up here and put a hash mark in front of this and pick one of the more strict training models, I can go back and run this code again. Now, when I uh, run the test, oh, wow, that was too strict. Okay, it didn't, didn't recognize any faces at all. That's pretty bad. Okay, let's try a different one. Maybe the second one will work. Let's try that. Okay. Oh, okay. I think we found the sweet spot. So those different models are like, you know, the least strict ones are really good at finding faces, but they have a lot of false positives. The more strict ones, if it finds a face, you can be pretty sure it's a face, but it also misses stuff. So anyway, this is the kind of thing that you can play around with. And, and of course, you'd want to have a training set like that worked for the kinds of images you wanted to do. So anyway, I hope this has gotten you interested in, and I encourage you to play around with these scripts a little bit. Try to find a URL of your own picture and paste it in here and see if you can get it to work or find your own text and put it in here and see if it'll find people's names. So play around with it, and um, I will, uh, if it, so we are at the end of our hour, and I'm actually at the end of what I wanted to say, so that worked out pretty well. So I, I will go ahead, and if people have any questions, either logistical questions or um, questions about how to use the notebooks or whatever, I would be happy to answer those questions. So just to recap about for next week, um, the example notebook, let's see, let's go back to programming basics, lesson videos. All you have to do is go down to lesson collab notebook, click on that, and then go up and say, save a copy in drive. And then you're ready. Then you have your own copy of the lesson notebook. So then when you're watching the videos, you could, the, the cells on this lesson notebook will go along in the same order as the videos. So between now and the next time you meet, hopefully you can work your way through the examples in this code notebook.